What do you think a fairy should look like? It's this question, perhaps more than any other, which has to be answered by the production team staging this play. The way they did it at Glyndebourne a few years back, when they were almost part of the trees and then they appeared. And... I, I mean, it's nice if they do look pretty, yeah. but then you've got to have a Mendelssohn and all that sort of jazz, you know. Well, people don't do it like that these days, do they? <laughs> like Sugar Plum Fairy. <laughs> you see, you're talking to a man who actually sees different things like auras and all of that, so I believe in, in, in the uh, looking at the world differently. So, for me, Vibrant. But they're little things with wings. The Regent's Park Theatre puts on the play regularly, and many of its patrons may well have seen three or four different versions over the years. A Midsummer Night's Dream is a childhood favourite, so audiences have strong ideas about what is fitting, and directors do as well. I wanted to get rid of the whole idea of these awful people with diamante makeup, the corner of their eyes, walking on the balls of their feet, flitting in with yards of bejeweled chiffon behind them. Um, and in the same way, I wanted to get rid of all these gauzy, diaphanous, um, entomological fairies, which somehow are regarded as de rigueur when people talk about the magic. What are you going to do about the magic? And they will say, well, that's not a, they're, they're not fairies, as if someone has got some privileged access to fairies and knows what fairies look like. So I decided not to give them wings because obviously they can't fly in this theatre. I mean, you could do it on wires or whatever. But flying in the play has, you know, it is a poetic thing, flying f for the fairies. It's a, a journey that they go on. And the, the play is a dream. And in dreams, flying means all sorts of different things. So if directors can't make their fairies really fly, they have to come up with new ways of creating magic for the modern world. But all I have is this memory of fairies in black bin liners. So I'm sure that it's going to be better than that tonight. I mean, Spielberg can do wonderful things with computers, but here it's people. It's sort of slightly more real. It's, it's immediate. Do they have magic wands as well? They have magic wands as well. And they're very light and elf-like. We always have this stupid idea of something which is, and every generation recreates it, of something which is traditional Shakespeare you know, which is doublet and hose and gauze wings in, 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 this, in, this, uh, in this play. And in a funny way, we keep on creeping back to it through rejecting those sorts of notions of the fact that it's an abstract space. Uh, I think people have to, you know, learn again and be told again and again, particularly in a televisual age, uh, that theatre is an abstract place. It's, it, it's, it's a, uh, you know, a square in a circle or something like that. It's an empty space. In this section of the video, I want to introduce you to some notable productions of this century. The first of these, Peter Brooks for the Royal Shakespeare Company in 1970, has passed into theatrical legend. Watch how Brooke interprets magic in the 20th century and how he uses the physical resources of the theatre to conjure up his own brand of stage magic. You'll also see how he has influenced subsequent directors. Every word has a meaning and words get debased. Magic has a meaning and has a reality. But that has nothing to do with conjuring tricks. We start with a brilliant white light a white background and all the elements clearly seen. I think for most of us who worked in the theatre, there was something quite revolutionary about the, the dream that Peter Brook did. I mean, it didn't change my mind about the setting of The Midsummer Night's Dream. It changed all of our minds about the, the way in which things could be staged. The fact that the plays didn't have to literally represent what seemed to be mentioned in them. And certainly that's what Brooke showed us, that the fact that fairy flight uh, is mentioned in the play doesn't mean that you have to use it in that way. And what he did was to use metaphors of swings and trapezes and spinning plates on the end of uh, flexible poles and so forth to represent flowers and flight. 
Um, and the fact that it didn't have to take place in something which literally represented a forest. It liberated us all from literal representation. What Brooke was doing was rejecting a tradition of those little things with wings that had dominated productions for decades. What thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love take. Love and languish for his sake, be it ounce or cat or bear, hard or boar with bristled hair in thine eye that shall appear. When thou wakest, it is thy dear. Wake when some vile thing is near. I had a very strong feeling that behind the play as we know it was something much richer and fuller. And I felt that this could come to life in a theatre through using a very wide range of theatrical techniques. So that in rehearsal, we'd arrived at this white box and a lot of possibilities galleries and trapezes, and a lot of brilliant colors in movement. The excitement of rehearsal is coming with open possibilities that then grow and develop through the collaboration with the actors. Shakespeare, in talking, in writing a play, of which there are many themes, if we say illusion and reality, it's only one of the themes, decided that as a as a metaphor for this, something that he could work through, he would he took the most dazzlingly simple solution, which then he would work through the theatre. So he said, I'm going to do a play about illusion and reality, and for this I am going to use the action of make-believe. The action of make-believe means that my play is going to be about a play within a play within a play. It's a play about some people who are not actors who decide to become actors to do a play. And in the process of their doing the play, strange questions of what a play is even emerge. Masters, you ought to consider with yourselves. To bring him. God shield us. A lion among ladies is the most dreadful thing. For there is not a more fearful wild fowl than your lion living. And we ought to look to it. Therefore, another prologue must tell he's not a lion. Yeah. Now you must name his name. And half his face must be seen through the lion's neck, and he himself must speak through, saying thus, or to the same defect, ladies or fair ladies, I would ask you or I would uh, request you or I would beseech you not to tremble, not to fear my life for yours. If you think I come hither as a lion, it were pity on my life. No, I'm no such thing. I'm a man, as other men are. And then, indeed, let him name his name and tell them plainly. Snug. Snug. <laughs> Snug the joiner. Well, it shall be so. Yeah. How important for you is that conversation of the workmen preparing their play for the nobles? It seemed to me very key to you. Yes, because in a very short time, all the arguments, all the theories of the modern theatre are all dealt with. That you can find the whole of the work of Brecht, you can find the results of almost all the round tables and discussions of directors all over the world, all through the last century, all summed up in these very in these few lines, of which the strongest one for me is the assertion that the theatre is about men, by men, for men. Must I speak now? Aye, Mary, must you? You must understand, he goes but to see a noise that he heard and is to come again. Oh. <clears throat> Most rate. Mo 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 Most radiant, Pyramus. Most... Lily white of hue, of, of colour, like the red rose and triumphant briar. 
most brisky juvenile, and eke most lovely Jew, as true, as true as toss, that yet would never tire. I'll meet thee, Pyramus, at Ninny's tomb. He Ninus tomb, man. Ninus. <laughs>